Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam amma ba'd. Ahabita fillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hayyakum Allah. Continuing on in our study of Bulugh Maram, we reached or we were continuing on in the Kitab, Kitab al Jami', the comprehensive book, and we were in the the chapter in the comprehensive book, Bab Tarhib min Masawi al Ikhlaq, the chapter of the uh, bad mannerisms, the chapter of bad. Akhlaq, the, of, of negative mannerisms, ne mannerisms that we want to avoid because they contradict the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And so this is the group of hadith as we are reiterating what we've already said, that these are the group of hadith that Ibn Hajar rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatin wasiya, that he compiled regarding traits and characteristics and adab and manners that we should strive to avoid. That we, as mu'mineen, should do our best to avoid. And we'll begin with the hadith of Ma'akul ibn Yasar, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And this is hadith 1285. Narrated Ma'kul bin Yasar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, I heard Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, There is no one whom Allah has placed in charge of people and who dies while acting unjustly towards those who are under his charge except that Allah has forbidden him from paradise. Mutafakun alayhi. This hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is in the ahadith which illustrate those bad and wicked manners. And the reason being because dhulm, oppression, is forbidden by Allah Azza wa Jal and was forbidden by the Messenger of Allah alayhi salatu wa salam. And those are from a uh, the wicked mannerisms. And the implications of oppression, that when you oppress uh, someone, or you oppress a people, or you oppress a society, that we understood, we understand from the text that that oppression will come back to you, either in this life, or in the next, or both. وَعِيَاذٍ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ ظُلْمٍ May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us and you from oppression. And so, with that being the case, this hadith fits into those group of ahadith which uh, illustrate, which, which uh, talk about those manners which we should avoid because oppression is something which is wicked. And some of the worst oppression, as we talked about in the pri uh, prior durus, is the oppression of <clears throat> Uh, the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is what? What is the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I have not created mankind in jinn except for the purpose of worshipping me. Letting us know the divine purpose, the divine reason behind creation, that it is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is actualizing ibadah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And when we worship other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, in Zulma, in Shirk li Zulmul Azim, that Shirk. Polytheism is the greatest form of oppression. It is the greatest form of dhulm. And that means when you practice polytheism, you have now taken away the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You've went against your divine 
uh, the divine reason of why you were created. You've taken Allah's right. And in an authentic hadith of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the hadith of Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he was riding with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on a donkey and he said, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ya Mu'adh, tadri ma haqq Allah ali ibadi wa ma haqq al ibadi ala Allah. Ya Mu'adh, O Mu'adh, do you know the right of Allah over his servants and the right of the servants of, uh, upon Allah. And then Mu'adh responded, he said, Allah wa Rasulu a'lam. Allah and his messenger know best. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam articulated, he said, articulated and expounded upon his point. He said, Haqq Allah ali badi and ya'buduhu wa la yushilku bi shayin. The right of Allah upon his servant is that you worship, that he worships him and him alone and he doesn't commit any form of of polytheism. So there, then we know that now that's the right of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when we violate that right, that's a type of oppression. Then there's also oppression of oneself. How do you oppress yourself? Is it by not eating and drinking? No. Oppressing oneself is by committing sin and mukhalifat from the shar. By committing things or sins or actions or statements which go against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion. Being sinful. Because it doesn't hurt Allah, it hurts you. And then of course there is oppression of others in the creation. And this is the, uh, the primary topic of this hadith. From this hadith, <clears throat> some of the benefits uh, gathered that Imam uh, bin Uthameen, rahmatullahi alayhi, rahmatullahi wasiya, Mention with regards to this hadith, uh, this hadith, uh, the hadith of uh, uh, Ma'kul, he said that the one of the benefits is that we understand, or this hadith uh, shows us that all affairs are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another benefit of this hadith is that ghash or um, cheating and corruption. And, uh, that is practiced by someone and they do not that it, that if a person uh, is uh, dies by oppressing someone dies and continues to oppress people or and and cheat people and so forth that if they die in that state then they are they've committed a major sin and they are deserving of that punishment because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, because the Prophet والسلام, mentioned that in the hadith, he said, uh, there, is no, there is no one whom Allah has placed in charge of people and who dies while acting unjustly towards those who are under his charge, except that Allah has forbidden him from paradise. So that's a stern warning for leaders. That's a stern warning for heads of households. That's a stern warning for heads of companies. That's a stern warning for anyone who has a leadership role and has others who are dependent upon them or others who are under them as far as their uh, their status or, or what have you, that they are uh, the leaders or whoever are responsible for those individuals, that they, that's a stern warning not to be oppressive. And the one who does make Tawbah from this, who does repent, of course, then they, bi'idnillah, will not have this, uh, this punishment. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith is also one of those ahadith which illustrate the importance of giving advice to the leaders. And a last uh, important point I want to mention with this hadith is that this hadith also shows that this is one of the major sins, uh, the one who, uh, that oppression and rush and cheating, that those are from amongst the major sins. In the next hadith, hadith 1286, narrated to Aisha, anha, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa said, O oh Allah, whoever is given charge over any affair of my ummah, and causes them distress, then cause him distress. Ruahu Muslim. This is a Sahih Muslim. This is a hadith also showing us that oppression 
and uh, pr oppression and giving difficulty to people is a sinful practice and it's a stern warning for those people who are charged in authority in whatever capacity they have authority over others so <clears throat> in this hadith we see that the principle al jaza min jins al amal that the reward for something is part and parcel with the act that a person did meaning the one who for example related to this hadith the one who commits uh, who oppresses people in this life will be oppressed in the next. Al jaza min jins al amal. That the part of the the reward, if you will, or better, instead of the re the reward, perhaps the result of the action is commensurate with the act that was that was done. So if a person does this sin, then they receive a portion of that sin in the hereafter. Okay, and that also goes in a good way. If a person does certain actions of righteousness, that those same actions of righteousness or something similar to it will be rewarded to them. And that is the principle that the scholars mentioned, al jaza min jents al amal. And so this is a hadith which illustrates uh, that principle that the one who does who shakka al muslimin that causes difficulty uh, upon the believers that Allah will give them difficulty. And so that's a stern warning for those charged in authority over others. And may Allah protect us from being oppressive. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Uh, from amongst the fawaid or benefits of this hadith, uh, one of the benefits is that it is an obligation upon those people who are charged in authority over the affairs of the Muslims uh, to be gentle with them as much as possible to be lenient with them as much as possible so it shows us those traits of leniency that this is what uh, Islam is encouraging us to do and especially those charged in authority because other people are dependent upon you other people are looking to you and other people are at your discretion you know you have the ability because you have authority over them to harm them and make things difficult for them so the role of a good leader, whether that's the leader of the Muslims in general or the leader of a household, is that they make the affairs easy upon the people and not difficult upon them. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows us the hirs or the vigilance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his gen in being gentle with his ummah. The Prophet ﷺ was gentle, rathq, walin. He had gentleness and kindness towards his ummah. How many times do we have a hadith? For example, the hadith that the Prophet ﷺ said, Lola and ushuka la ummati li amartun bisawak, bisawak in the kuli salat. Or kama qala Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet ﷺ said, If it wasn't that I feared for causing difficulty for my ummah, I would have commanded them would be miswak for every salat. That, ahabati fillah, shows us the, uh, the gentleness of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith, as we mentioned, shows and illustrates al jaza min jins al amal. Another benefit of this hadith is that it also shows the that a person has a right to ask for their haq, to ask for their rights uh, that are taken from them. That is your right. So, and Ben Uthaymin, he articulates this. He says, أَنَّهُ يُجُوزْ insan. So that means for people in general, not just as, as a Muslim right, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given this right that a person has a right to ask for their haq, for their rights. So it goes for the Muslim and the non-Muslim. If a Muslim is oppressing a non-Muslim, the, the non-Muslim has a right to ask for their rights. 
if the Muslim is oppressing another Muslim, the Muslim has a right to ask for his rights, or vice versa. However, the situation is a person has a right to ask for their haq, to ask for their haq, and that is not that is their right, and that is not from uh, rebellion. So people have to distinguish that uh, that when uh, some of the people have confusion over this uh, this issue. Go, moving on to the next hadith, <clears throat> narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu tana'an, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, when any one of you fights, he must avoid hitting the face mutafakun alayhi. This is a hadith which also shows that hitting from the face is, is impermissible and that it is not from the uh, the righteous conduct of the Muslim. And that's why Ibn Hajar put it in this group of ahadith, that this is not befitting for the believer. And how many questions with the recent, uh, relevant to the recent victory of our brother, Habib, who fought a famous uh, fighter in the MMA, uh, Conor McGregor and defeated him and so many of the people they show an interest in the sport of MMA but Ben Othamin he talks about this even before the sport took place he talks about the impermissibility that it's even more a greater form of impermissibility uh, you know boxing and stuff because you are striking the face without a hadja without a need to do so meaning you don't have to uh, be in the ring, even if that is that's how they make their livelihood. But that is not um, justifiable in the show. And so this hadith illustrates for us that this is one of those. Um, this is from those the, those mannerisms, which are um, disliked and which are not befitting for the mu'min. So what we learn from this hadith is the obligation to avoid striking the face uh, even in conflict. Even in conflict, you should avoid striking the face and Ben Othamin mentions, as much as possible. And we know that in uh, a real conflict situation in which you have to defend your property and your rights and so on and so forth that more than likely it uh, more often than not when it comes to real combat someone is uh, attacking you an aggressor for, against you and your family that you're more than likely the way to be effective is probably going to be to strike in the face so the, again he qualified it as much as possible and so this lets us know that there are times, there are those exceptions, but the, the main point is, is that you should avoid that if at all possible. Because the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam mentioned it. And there is wisdom behind that that the scholars mention. However, uh, we are not going to get into all of those things. Uh, one of the things that the, the Sheikh mentioned with regards to this hadith, he said that the face, it is the beauty of a person. So, and this brings up even the issue of hijab, that of covering the face, as we know that uh, men in general are attracted to the, one of the first things they see generally of a woman is looking at the face and even vice versa, that women look to the, uh, a point of attraction for them in general is the face. And so it shows us that the importance of the face and that by that from this that the scholars they deduce that from this hadith that this hadith is also affirming that point that the face is important and that one should not strike the face and that this is one of the reasons because that is something that's going to be apparent upon that person if you disfigure someone's face they of course, are disfigured and they will carry that perhaps for the rest of their life. So it shows 
that this is uh, an impermissible act and it shows us that the face is um, uh, you know is is what is uh, that people are look look at and are attracted to in the next hadith narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala an a man said O oh, Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advise me he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said do not get angry the man repeated that several times and he replied do not get angry al-Bukhari reported it in this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam it shows that becoming uh, that the person who becomes angry easily that this is an illustration of these negative traits which is not befitting for the mu'min that this is of the negative traits that contradicts prophetic adab and so the it's la yanbaghi or is not befitting for the believer to possess those traits and the one who does possess these traits should strive to work on uh, improving themselves and controlling his or herself and their temperament uh, this hadith in this hadith of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned that uh, the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked about uh, you know, it was asked for advice, and this was the nature of the Sahaba to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam radiyallahu ta'ala anhu majma'in is that they were uh, vigilant in trying to uh, attain sound Islamic knowledge and those things which would benefit them, those things which would bring them closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so they would often ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for fatwa or they would often ask the Prophet sallallahu for advice. And these are positive traits. These are positive traits. And in that regard, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned and gave that advice, advising the person with very, very relevant to that person's uh, situation and very important advice in general and that is be, uh, to to uh, not become angry because how many conflicts and how much destruction and devastation was is a result of people not being able to control their anger uh, and it is there's countless destruction even between nations that if two people that are in in positions of power and authority cannot articulate what they are attempting to articulate and achieve and have positive aims and positive outcomes in a manageable way that sometimes that anger can be the result uh, the result of that anger can be uh, nations can go to war and massive death and destruction so we see that on the broad level, on the general scale, but also on the micro level, which is between individuals, that when two individuals have a, 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 a difficulty in resolving their issues, that this can result in violence. And so it's very important that from the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is that we learn how to control our temperament. And we talked about this prior to this, some of the things that result is that people can divorce out of anger. And then the scholars, the Qadi, the judge will look at that Islamically and look at that in a way in, to determine the level of anger. Was it a level of anger? Did the person reach to such an uh, extent in their anger that uh, it nullif uh, it, they were completely unaware of what they said? Or did, were they severely angered and they were cognizant of what they said. This is what the judge will determine as far as whether the divorce took place or not. And again, this is a result of anger. So it's very important, and from the sunnah, and from the righteous mannerisms of the Prophet wasallam, is that one controls his or her anger. From the benefits of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah wasallam, one of those benefits is it shows us the hikmah, the wisdom of the Messenger of Allah in that he advised everyone 
with regards to their uh, their condition. And some of the background of this hadith is that this person that was asking, as it is mentioned, that this person perhaps was a person who needed advice regarding anger management. And so the Prophet ﷺ, realizing that from his hikmah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he advised him with what, with what was relevant to him. Although this advice is shaman, you know, it's, it's, it's um, very uh, important for all of us to have uh, this trait of anger management or controlling one's anger. Another benefit of this hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that the person who is giving a fatwa or giving advice to someone that they should look to the condition of the person who is asking the question or the person seeking the advice. That's imperative. And that's a beautiful faida, a beautiful benefit that we gain from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But how often, unfortunately, people don't realize that in practice. And sometimes that even uh, affects some scholars, especially younger scholars who don't know the situation, maybe in a country or a situation of the person asking the question or the person who the question is asked on behalf of them. This is why it is important for the scholar to even ask sometimes to gain some background knowledge. And as we mentioned prior to this on countless occasions, that a very important qaida or principle that the scholars mention in uh, related to fiqh is that a hukum ala shay far'in ala tasawwurihi that a judgment regarding a particular issue or even arbitration is dependent on having a correct view or correct background information regarding that person or that situation or that question. Let's give an example just so that we, we have a, a clear uh, example and first from this hadith, this hadith itself, the Prophet ﷺ, this man asked several times. He asked the Prophet ﷺ, advise me. The Prophet ﷺ knew his status, knew about this man, knew something from his background. So he advised him with what was relevant to him. He knew the hal, he knew the condition of this individual. And so he said, La taqba, don't become angry. Then he said, advise me. Again, he asked the next, next time. The Prophet said, la taqbam. He did that three times. He could have given another advice. Oh, okay, that's this. So it shows the importance of Prophet Sallallahu was very sure and affirming the importance of that and especially relevant to the individual asking. So this is very important that a person, uh, when giving advice or a scholar that is giving a fatwa or a hukum, a ruling, that they have a good tasawr, a sahih tasawr, a sound, legitimate, or, or um, a picture of what is being asked, or the situation regarding the individual asking, or the, uh, those people it will affect. Let's give another example just to make it clear, and this is something relevant for some of us, in our various countries, a lot of times you will have individuals, they will send questions to some of the scholars in other countries. And they will ask them, Sheikh, in such and such country we have an individual who does this. Maybe they want to uh, belittle that individual or they want to declare him an innovator in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion. We have a certain person named so-and-so and he's this. And then the Sheikh may make a hukum from what they describe. Described. And so it's even important that it's there's some caution and you see this from a lot of the major scholars that they exercise caution in handing out these verdicts because they know that sometimes the implications that it is a destruction of the dawah in the country that is being taken place or the people don't 
give accurate information. Sometimes the people are not trustworthy individuals who are asking these questions, or they ask these questions in order for a, uh, a, a negative and uh, invalid reason or some some way to harm particular individuals instead of for the maslaha or the benefit of the dawah. So it's very important that when someone makes a hukum or they make a fatwa that they have a good tesor, they have a good um, view and background information about what is being asked. And that's one of the benefits we gave from this hadith. Another benefit from this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi while Ali Wasallam is that this uh, this hadith also illustrates that the questioner can ask uh, can repeat the question in order to make sure and to affirm what is being said so in this situation this was not considered uh the individual was not looking for a way out from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam his answer of being of not becoming angry the individual was not looking for other ways to change the change the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's ruling or anything but he just wanted to affirm he wanted to affirm, or maybe he wanted additional advice. That could have been the case as well. And the Prophet ﷺ gave him what was useful for him. And so it shows us that it is permissible, that it is okay to ask for clarification when you're asking for a fatwa, or you're asking for advice, or whatever the case may be. And it is okay to, 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 uh, you know, ask for that clarification, and in order to affirm that. Uh, the the ruling or whatever is being said another benefit of this hadith is as we said in the beginning is that this is from the uh, anger this hadith illustrates for us that uh, anger management is very important for the mu'min and that from the blameworthy characteristics of a person is that they do not control their anger, that they are unable to control themselves. And those are some of the main benefits that we gain from that hadith. In the next hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam narrated khawla Al Ansariya radiallahu ta'ala anha, Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Some men wrongfully acquire from the wealth of Allah. So they will enter the hellfire on the day of resurrection. Uh, and Bukhari uh, reported this hadith. In this hadith of Khola radiallahu ta'ala anha, We see that from the uh, from the negative traits is people who wrongly uh, acquire wealth, meaning they do things in an impermissible way. They do things. They maybe earn their living through haram means, through riba, through interest, through uh, criminal activity and sin that these are of course from the sinful traits and things which are la, uh, that are not uh, befitting for the mu'min. And so this hadith shows us that also that the person who does this, that their reward is jahannam, is the hellfire. وَعِيَادٍ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ And in the hadith, the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam said, يَتَخَوَّذُونَ فِي مَالِ اللَّهِ That they, what means basically that they wasted the wealth of Allah. And that, that was what was mentioned in the hadith that some men wrongfully acquire 
And then in quotations, they say spin because the meaning here of chov is, uh, it has two uh, meanings. As uh, Imam bin Rahimin, he mentions that this can uh, relate to that either the person earns this wealth through haram means. Okay, so they're earning it in a, in a haram way. This is one form of chov bil mal is that they are earning it maybe from criminal activity, drugs, prostitution, whatever the case may be, uh, or interest, or whatever the case, and this is impermissible. This is haram, and this is the type of chod that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam is mentioning. The other type of chod, bil mal, is that the person, after earning their means so it can, they can earn it in a, a a lawful way perhaps but then it's how they spend it maybe they're wasteful maybe they spend it in haram so they have a halal living and they actually spend their money on drugs prostitution muharramat drugs whatever the case may be they use it for haram activities wa'iyadhin billah min dhalika from the benefits of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the tahrim or the impermissibility of tahawwad bil mal of you know wasting our money or earning it from unlawful sources or spending it on unlawful in unlawful means so wealth is something that should be protected and used for halal and used for khayr and used for things that will benefit you in this life as well as the hereafter. Uh, another benefit of this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is this hadith shows us that it is uh, impermissible, impermissible for a person to earn wealth from haram means and through oppressive means you know through oppression or cheating or anything which is unlawful that we have to earn a lawful uh lawful means uh uh you know sustaining ourselves and our families and we have to spend our wealth in you know in lawful ways uh, another benefit of this hadith is as the messenger of allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned in the hadith he said fi malillah in the wealth of allah so what we learn from this statement is that all here we see the idafa to mal lillah that all wealth and this is according to the etiqad of the mu'min of the believer is that we believe that our rizq is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala naam you perhaps you, you have a job and you worked in order to get your position, you got a degree, you got a college degree, and you're working in your field to be an engineer or whatever the case may be. And that 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 degree helped you to get the position because you needed, you required education for that. And you earned it. You went out and you sought the employment and you achieved it. But ultimately, that risk the fact that you were successful in every aspect of that, it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is how the mu'min, they think, whereas others, disbelievers and others, they don't, at least some of them, do not attribute those earnings to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the wealth that it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's wealth, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you that risk and that you should also spend it in a way that's pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because ultimately it's his, it's from him. The rizq is from Allah Azza wa Jal. So that's very important for us to have uh, an understanding of that in our creed, in our itiqad, in our belief about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another benefit of this hadith is that this hadith also shows us that it is permissible for a person if they uh, mention, for example, a scholar or someone that they, if they mention a hukum, that if they know 
that if the scholar mentions the ruling to that uh, they can also mention some of the hikmah or wisdom behind that or the reasoning behind that in order to give comfort to the hearts of the person uh, who is taking that information or who requires that ruling. So this is uh, illustrated in this hadith because the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, without the right. So he gave the reason uh, for this punishment is that a person, you know, takes, uh, you know, acquires wealth wrongfully, you know, without the, 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 the right and that they will earn the hellfire due to that. So the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam gave the reasoning and that can assure a person that they that they know now the wisdom behind that and they know the uh you know to to add comfort to the hukum to the ruling behind that and so that helps to affirm in the hearts of those people who are quest uh, seeking answers to know the illan to know the reason behind the ruling if it is clear uh, that reason. In the next hadith, hadith 1290, narrated Abu Dhar عنه, quoted the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam saying among what he narrated from his Lord Allah Azzawajal, that he subhanahu wa ta'ala said O oh my slaves I have made zulm, oppression injustice unlawful for myself and I have made it unlawful amongst you so do not oppress one another and Muslim reported this hadith in this hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, which is from a, just a portion of a longer hadith of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is known as the Hadith al-Qudsi. And this means this is a hadith which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam narrated upon his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, our Lord tabaraka wa ta'ala, the Lord of mankind, the Lord of the non-Muslims and the Muslims, the Lord of the jinn and mankind, the Lord of all creation, Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of all creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala. That this is a hadith which the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam narrated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this hadith of the Messenger of Allah, or this hadith of Qudsi, the hadith of Abi Dhar, radiallahu ta'ala, it is listed or it is compiled in uh, Imam ibn Hajr, rahmatullahi alayhi, rahmatullahi he compiled this hadith or put this hadith in the chapter in Kitab al Jami' in the comprehensive book, Bab Tarheeb min Masawil Akhlaq, from the uh, chapter of wicked uh, manner mannerisms or characteristics because as we mentioned prior to this voom oppression is uh, one of the great sins uh, and oppression is from wicked mannerisms it is a wicked trait and so we see that this uh, this hadith shows us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, huwa ala kulli shayin qadir and he is he's over all things omnipotent and he tabarak wa ta'ala inna Allah la yakhfa alayhi shayin fil ardi wa la fi sama that verily nothing nothing is concealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heavens and earth because he created everything and he knows and sees everything tabarak wa ta'ala he's al alim he's al basir he is sami al basir tabarak wa ta'ala 
He's the all-hearing. He's the all-seeing. He's the all-knowing. And so, it's very important that we understand that and not be oppressive and not carry this wicked trait which the Prophet Ali uh, uh, narrated from his Lord that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala detests this and prohibits this or forbids himself to wa ta'ala uh, from this trait. This hadith This hadith has uh, many, many, many benefits. And from those benefits, from amongst those benefits, is that this hadith affirms for us that the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that, that uh, uh, it affirms that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kalam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has speech to wa ta'ala that this is from his divine characteristics and that's what Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah believes and Ahlul Sunnati wal Jama'ah believes that the Quran is from the kalam of Allah it's from the divine speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in a, a manner as befits him and how he pleases and when he subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, pleases. And that this speech is from the sifat or from the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that it is not created and that it is not, that it is real, that it is not uh, metaphorical. This is what distinguishes Ahl Sunnah from Ahl Kalam, from some of the groups that use their intellect in order to uh, make rulings about the text instead of the text themselves. Meaning that they look to a lot of, uh, they reason, they use their reasoning. And what befits them as individuals or them as groups to say, hey, no, that doesn't make sense. It must mean this. So they use their intellect in order to arbitrate and navigate the nasus. That doesn't mean we throw out our intellect. No. But rather, Ahlul Sunnah looks to the apparent meaning of the text. And that unless there's a reason to move from that which is apparent and clear and that we have no other delil or evidence to show us otherwise, then we take it at its face value. So for example, regarding the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala possesses speech, tabarak wa ta'ala, and the, the, the Quran is, the, is, is not created and it is the divine speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it is his, uh, from his sifat. And we believe that from the sifat of our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala is that he rose above his throne in a manner that suits his majesty because he subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in several places in the Quran that he rose above his throne. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we believe that he subhanahu wa ta'ala descends but not like his creation because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Laysa kamithli shaywa huwa sami' al-basir that there's nothing like him but he is the all-hearing and all-seeing. And the Prophet ﷺ said in an authentic hadith, يَنزِلُ رَبُّنَا تَبَارَكُ وَتَعَلَى كُلُّ ثُلُّ فَاللَّيْلَ الْآخِرُ فَيَقُولُ That our Lord descends to the last, in the last third of the night, to the lowest heaven. This is what the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said. So Ahl Sunnah, they stop with those missiles. They stop with those texts. They don't say, well, you know, in China, it's this time. Seattle, it's this time. Saudi Arabia, it's this time. I'm not sure if we can, uh, you know, we need to uh, figure this out. That means he's 
descending at this time in such and such place. And, you know, Ahl Sunnah doesn't get into those things because that's not what the Prophet ﷺ ordered us to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't command us to do. Instead, we were commanded to accept what came with the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And khalas, we stop with the, with the text. This is the minhaj of the methodology of Ahl Sunnah with Jama'ah. They don't test and they don't question the Nasus, but they have taslim in their hearts. They have peace and tranquility with those texts. But many of the other sects and other traditions that they instead begin to use, give precedence to their reasoning, even to an extent to where they negate those uh, attributes, so, as such as groups like the Ma'atala, like the Ma'tazila, or uh, some of the other groups, the Jahamiya, and some of them begin to negate the Nasus and say, no, no, Allah doesn't descend at all. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't rise above his throne, even though they read the Quran. Even though they read the Quran and understand it. But obviously they don't understand those sifat because their intellect, their reasoning, their rationale will not allow them to just submit to the Nasus and make taqdeem al nusus al al-aql, to give precedence to the text and what it says from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam over their intellect. And that's the difference between Ahlul Sunnah and Ahlul Kalam. That's a, a big primary difference, uh, and especially when it comes to the divine sifat of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Uh, another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also affirms for us that all creation is from the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even if they don't submit uh, shir'in, But they are all created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even if someone is disobedient to Allah or they disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and disbelieve in his commands and disbelieve in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were still created by Allah. And in the general sense, they are from the servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, likewise, even the animals. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this regard says, Fi Kitab al -Kareem, in kullu man fi samawati wal ard illa ata rahmani abdan. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Kitab al Kareem, Verily, everything in the heavens and earth, they come to Ar Rahman, the most merciful, as a servant. Letting us know we're all created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of us have that duty to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our various ways, meaning especially from amongst the creatures that they have their own way of submitting to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're all servants of Allah azza wa jal in that regard. That doesn't make us all believers though. All believers or all mu'min. So that's qawniya, not shar'iya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فِي al kareem أَلَمْ تَرَى أَنَّ اللَّهَ يَسْجُدُ لَهُ مَنْ فِي السَّمَوَاتِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَالشَّمْسُ وَالْقَمْرُ وَالنُّجُومُ وَالْجِبَالُ وَالشَّجَرُ وَالدَّوَابُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Hajj Tabarak wa ta'ala He says And don't you see that everything, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala submits everything to him. That is in the heavens and in the earth, the sun and the moon and the stars and the mountains and the trees and the animals. All of these things are servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they submit to his command. They will live and they will die. They were created and they will be extinguished. And this is from the Amr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there are many ayat that illustrate this for us. Another benefit of this hadith is that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself subhanahu 
prohibited oppression upon himself. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not oppressive. He is al-adl. He's the most just subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that from his divine wisdom, many things happen that we see that we may not like, that maybe entail punishments from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which are from his divine wisdom and not from oppression, but rather from his justice and his divine wisdom and his tests for his servants. And he prohibited zulm ala nafsi. He uh, prohibited uh, oppression upon himself, tabarak wa ta'ala. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith also shows that Allah the Almighty uh, prohibits upon himself uh, what he wishes. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in another hadith Qudsi, لَمَا قَدْ اللَّهُ خَلْقْ كَتَبَ فِي كِتَابِهِ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ فَهُوَ مَوْضُوعٌ إِنْدَهُ إِنَّ رَحْمِتِي تَغْلِبُ غَلِّبِي That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wrote when he created the creation that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed the creation لَمَا قَدْ اللَّهُ خَلْقْ كَتَبَ فِي كِتَابِي عَلَى نَفْسِهِ He wrote in a book about himself that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could could do this about himself and limit himself to barak wa ta'ala in the rahmati, verily my mercy supersedes my anger or my wrath. And that is something that only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can prohibit on himself. No one else has any shan or any uh, share in those affairs. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith affirms for us that the that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it affirms for us that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, uh, that he and his that is unlike his creation, and his creation is unlike him, but that he has a self, his self. And we don't describe, we don't know how. The kafiyah, we don't know, as Imam Malik was talking about when he talked about the... Uh, characteristics of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the qa'id that Imam Malik laid down, which comes from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that when he was talking, a man asked him, you know, when he mentioned, Ar Rahman ala arsh istawa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kitab al Ar Rahman ala arsh istawa, that the most merciful uh, rose above his throne. So this is the qa'id of Ahl Sunnah, this is how Ahl Sunnah sees these divine sifat. Imam Malik mentioned that and uh, someone asked him and said, Yo, Ya, Ya, Abu Abdullah, O Abu Abdullah, O Father of Abdullah. Cave is stoa. How does Allah rise? Or how did he raise? How did he raise above his throne? How? Imam Malik became very angry and he began to sweat profusely. And he said, Al istawa ma'lum. Wa kayf majhu. Wa su'al anhu bid'a. In one of the narrations, Imam Malik said, Al istawa, the raising is known. We know this because we know the meaning in the Arabic language. We know uh, what it means. That Allah rose above his throne in a manner that suits his majesty. Al-Kayf, al-How, we don't know. We don't have that knowledge. Allah didn't give us that. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi didn't give us details about that. We don't know how. Meaning we don't need to know how. We don't need to ask these questions. This is the difference between Ahl Sunnah and Ahl Kalam. Ahl Kalam wants to negate that. Or some of them make resemblance. Or some of them uh, negate the attribute of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Or some of them, they make ta'wil, they change the meaning of it, of those verses, to suit their intellect. But Ahl Sunnah says, La, we make taslim and nusus. As Imam Malik, he became angry. And he said, the kafi and majhul, we don't, we don't know how. And he said, and asking about it is bid'ah. Asking about it is an innovation. It's not, it's an innovation in the religion. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ didn't tell us about it and he didn't give us details about it and he didn't ask about it. 
The, the, the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and Ajma'een didn't ask about it. The how. And they didn't make explanation of it. And the Tabi'een, likewise, they didn't ask. And so on and so forth. So it lets us know Aswal Anhu is bid'ah. That asking about it is bid'ah. We don't need to know that knowledge. We just need to know Ar Rahman al Ars is And we need to know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, we, and that's a part of our itiqad. That's a part of our belief. Taslim lin nasus. So that's a qaida that we also gain from this hadith is the qaida of Ahlul Sunnah of accepting the text. Accepting authentic text. If it's been authenticated, we accept that. We accept that as a part of our itiqad. We don't say all oh, that. We don't have the arguments of Ahlul Kalam. Another benefit of this hadith is this hadith uh, shows us that it is impermissible to oppress. Whether that be oppressing Muslim, whether that be oppressing non-Muslims, whoever, no one deserves to be oppressed and it is impermissible, it's muharram to oppress people. So that's what we gain from this hadith. And we also understand, especially so, other Muslims. Even That's even greater because they have the sacredness of being from Ahli Iman and those things which are sacred. And the covenant of Islam. But even non-Muslims, anyone, you cannot oppress them. That's impermissible. It's haram. So you can't steal. You can't cheat the people. You can't uh, oppress them. This is not, that's not the, the way of the sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and that's what we gain from this hadith, hadith of Qudsi and we ask Allah the Almighty to accept our good and forgive our evil. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam.